Welcome to worship at Grand Avenue United Methodist Church. As we worship today, let us wave palms, for today we welcome Christ into our midst. As we worship, let us likewise shed tears, for today we remember Jesus' death. On this day, we bring our palms and we reflect upon Christ's passion. On this day, we laugh with joy and we also cry with anguish. On this day, we begin the holiest week of all. On this day, we likewise begin to grieve so that when we celebrate next Sunday, we may laugh in the face of anguish and celebrate the resurrection of Christ. And so let us with crowds say, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Friends, as we worship today, we celebrate with our children. They will lead us in a procession in just a moment, talking about the parade, the shortest parade in all of the world, a parade of one lonely peasant preacher riding on the back of a donkey as he makes his triumphal entry into the holy city of Jerusalem. Later, we will continue our journey with Jesus, making our walk. And as we have been considering those ways through prayer and worship, through study of scripture, through acts of service and giving and sharing our faith, we're going to see the way that Jesus himself embodied each of those, not only in all of his life, but even in the very moment of death. And so as we gather this Palm Sunday and this Passion Sunday, we welcome you to worship with us. As we worship, the words that you need will appear on the screen, but there's likewise in the comments and description attached to this video, an order of service that also contains information about upcoming events in the life of our church. Each week, beginning tonight, Sunday evening, we will be having um, at seven o'clock a service of devotion with music for Holy Week. We will be meditating on each of the seven last words that Christ spoke from the cross. We invite you to join us on Facebook Live or on our YouTube channel as we are lifting that up each evening at seven. We will offer an in-person worship experience on Thursday evening, Monday, Thursday, as our Reader's Theater presents a dramatic presentation of the Passion of the Christ, accompanied by music, both from our music ministry and also congregational singing. That will be at, at seven o'clock on Thursday evening, April the 1st, here in our sanctuary. On Easter Sunday, we are offering two in-person worship services. The first will be at 8.30 in the morning. The second will be at 10.45. And we're asking that you would pre-register with us to let us know that you are planning to come so that we can make sure that we've uh, reserved a space for you in our sanctuary and that we will have room for all. You can do that either by sending an email to the uh, address that's in the contacts below or you may phone the church office at the number that you see on your screen. We will ask you if you intend to come to the 830 service or the 1045 service and the number of people that you expect to bring with you. And that way we can make safe space for everyone as we wear masks, uh, remain socially distanced, and as we continue to wash our hands and sanitize the worship space so that it will be safe for everyone. As we are gathering for worship today, we invite you to light a candle so that you may remember that even in the darkest hours of Holy Week, you are surrounded by the inextinguishable light of Christ. And let us, as we are preparing, go to God in a time of prayer. Will you pray with me the words that appear on your screen? Let us pray. God of all times and places, we confess that we would rather join the crowds than stand alone. We prefer the popular point of view to a solitary witness for justice and truth. We like safety and security while shrinking from the risk of involvement. We'll sing Hosanna when everyone else is doing so, but not when the hostile Good Friday forces may hear us. We do not like to admit our lukewarm response to you but neither do we want to be considered fanatics. We believe Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, and we know that means us, not just other folk involved in obvious evils everyone knows about. We ask you to be patient with us, 
to help us understand our own guilt. Then pour out your forgiveness in such a way that we are forever transformed. In Jesus' name, amen. May God bless you as we worship together today. Before you leave, do take a moment to go to the links below and register your attendance. Share a prayer concern with us if you would like. If you would like to make a donation to our ministry to support it online or through the mail, the contact information is likewise there. And now let us rejoice as our handbells lead us in praise. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. boys and girls. It's so good to see you today. And welcome to all those who are watching us um, on the video. I'm going to tell you about Bray. Did you know that Hot Springs has the world's shortest St. Patrick's Day parade? Now for two years they haven't been able to have it. But when Brother David and I went a couple of years ago, we were standing on the street and they threw these beads at us. Oh, well, I got a up here. Can you catch that? There you go, Kinsley. All right. You're getting kidding. So when we were on the side of the street, we yelled and clapped real loud so they would throw things to us. Oh, you're getting kidding. And that's okay. And in, in Hot Springs, it's short parade because the street that it's on is very short. And so it's called the World's Shortest Parade. Well, I want you to know that in the Bible, there's also a very short parade. And it's a parade where Jesus is the only person in the parade. So he probably rode a long ways, but he was the only thing. There wasn't any more floats, there weren't any other bicycles or bands or anything. It was just Jesus riding on a donkey. He was coming to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover with his disciples. And he came into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. And you know what happened? The people that were along the side streets cut down palm branches and they started waving them. 
I'm going to get, put your beads down. I'm going to give you two of these, okay? And some of them put their coats down on the road so that the donkey can walk over. But the, uh, the rest of them took down palm branches and they waved the branches. So let's pretend that we're following along after Jesus and the donkey, okay? Can you stand up and have a little pray? And what, you know what they said? They said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You're not parading. Come on, Hosanna. <laughs> Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, usually we get to do this in the sanctuary. We get to walk all over the sanctuary and wave our palm. But we can't do that this Palm Sunday because of uh, the pandemic. Okay, you can have a seat. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So, we can keep those, yes. Yay. <laughs> so, what I want you to know about the parade is that the people were really happy to see Jesus. They knew that he had healed people and he had even raised people from the dead. And they were so happy to see him. But there were some people, the religious leaders, who didn't like Jesus very much. They were kind of jealous that he had all these followers. And so by the end of the week, they had convinced some of the people that were saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, to instead say, Crucify him, crucify him. And you know what happened? Jesus died on the cross for you and me. And then we get to have Easter Sunday. So I want you to listen when Brother David does his sermon because he's going to talk more about what happened in the rest of the week. And we'll have special services that go along with that. So let's pray. Dear God, you can say it after me, okay? Dear God, Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for me. We can hardly wait to celebrate Easter. Amen. Our scripture reading today is John chapter 12, verses 12 to 19 which tells of Jesus' triumph entry into the holy city of Jerusalem. Listen for the word of God. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. So the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to testify. It was also because they heard that he had performed this sign that the crowd went to meet him. The Pharisees then said one to another, you see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. May God bless the reading, hearing, and understanding of the Holy Scripture.
Let us pray. O oh God, as you have made yourself available to us in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, receive us as we make ourselves available to you in his name. Take my lips and speak through them. Take our thoughts and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you. For unless you speak, nothing of significance will be spoken. Give us your word, Lord Jesus, and let the people of God say, Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but I love a parade. From the time that I first watched the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, sitting on my dad's shoulders at the tender age of two, to the final steps that I made with the Jackson Central Mary High School marching band the year that I graduated, I've loved the pageantry and the procession. People of faith do too. For indeed, who are we but ones who follow in the footsteps of those who've gone before us, following in the footsteps of Jesus. From person to person, from generation to generation, God's truth is marching on. And so it is, especially this season, this season of Lent, we have been intentional about the steps that we have been taking. We've been going on a walk, going deeper and deeper in our relationship with Jesus as we make our way toward the cross of Calvary and the empty tomb of Easter. And we've been intentional about five specific steps. We focused the first week on prayer and on worship, and I challenged you to pray with me five times a day. The next week we talked about study, and I challenged you to read at least five verses of Scripture each day. The next week we turned our thoughts towards service and the ways that we can give ourselves to others in service the way that Jesus gave himself to us in five acts of kindness each week. The fourth week, we were talking about generosity, giving not only our time and our talent, but also our treasure. And we were talking about the use of money and the way that we can give in extraordinary ways five times each month. And then this past week, I challenged you to think of five ways that you could share your faith with others and invite five other people to come and, and be a part of this parade, of this procession. And along the way, we've seen that these are part and parcel of Jesus' life. And today, as we make our way from the palm procession with his triumphal entry, to the crucifixion on Calvary, we will see that indeed they are part of his life. And they were part of his life even to the point of death. As we approach the foot of the cross, we hear again the words that Christ speaks from there. There are seven utterances that are contained in the scripture, and these words matter. When someone who is about to take leave of you, when someone is dying, the last words that they speak to you are particularly important. And that's especially true of Jesus because, after all, he was dying by crucifixion. When someone was crucified, they uh, were either tied or nailed to a cross and, and raised uh, for all to see. It was an act of humiliation was also an act of excruciating torture, for indeed spikes were driven, not through the palms of the hands, but through the wrist, and also through the feet. And so, as a body hung there, it was exposed, and the pain was literally excruciating. The word excruciating comes from the same root as crucifixion, by the way. And whether a person died from shock or from extended pain or loss of bodily fluid, uh, it didn't really matter because it was, a, it was a horrible, horrible death. But most authorities believe that uh, most people died of asphyxiation or of um, suffocation because when you're hanging on a cross, it's extremely hard to breathe. In order to get more than a shallow breath, you have to literally pull yourself up by the nails that are driven through your wrist and through your feet. And as you grow weaker and weaker, it becomes harder and harder to do. And so if someone speaks words from the cross, you know that they are very intentional. And so it is with Jesus' words. The Gospels say that Jesus uttered seven times from the cross. Matthew and Mark uh, share one. Luke tells another three, and, and John adds three more to that. And these are words that are spoken at the end of his life. And I'd like for us to look today, as Adam Hamilton suggests, I'd like to look at the way that they point toward the fact that 
these five practices were important, even to the moment of Jesus' dying breath. The first word that I'd like for us to consider is the one that is included in Matthew and Mark's gospel. It's the one where Jesus prays, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This cry of dereliction is actually in the form of a prayer. Indeed, three of the seven utterances that Jesus makes from the cross are in the form of a prayer. It's hardly surprising. Jesus hemmed his life in with prayer. My grandmother used to say that if you wanted a, a piece of fabric not to ravel, that you should put a hem on either end. In the same way, if we don't want our lives to unravel, she said, we should hem our lives in with prayer. Jesus did that. He prayed with multitudes. He went to wilderness places and prayed on his own. Before he began and when he completed anything, he blessed it with prayer. He prayed all night before calling his disciples. He prayed at meals. Indeed, one of the words that we use for the sacred meal that he gave to us is Eucharist, a word which means thank you, the last week of his life. He spent every night on the Mount of Olives in prayer. And so it was hardly surprising that people could find him. He was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying the night that he was betrayed with a kiss, paraded through the town, tried on trumped up charges, and uh, crucified, dead, and buried. And here on the cross, he's praying, praying the scriptures. He's praying a prayer from Psalm 22, 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is to say that he was echoing the dereliction that King David had felt, the psalmist, when he had spoken those same words. How about you? Have you ever felt humiliated? Have you ever felt forsaken by God? Have you ever asked yourself, where was God when? Looking at the things that have been happening in the news this past week, when there have been natural disasters and, and when there have been especially hate crimes, the things that have been going on in Georgia and the things that have been going on in Colorado, those mass shootings. We know that God doesn't intend this to happen. God gives us free will and sometimes hate speech and hateful thoughts take over and God allows these things to happen, but it's not God's will. Jesus knew that. Jesus knew when he was going into the holy city of Jerusalem, he knew what lay ahead. He had already told his disciples what would happen. But even though he knew, still in this moment, he felt forsaken by God, which is to say that when we feel forsaken, we're not alone. Jesus can identify. The significant thing is that when he feels forsaken by God, the very next thing that he does is to express his faith through prayer. He prays, he turns to God. Sometimes when you don't feel faithful, but you still pray, it, it takes an even deeper act of faith. He's praying and he's quoting the scriptures. And indeed, with his very next breath, he quotes yet another psalm. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. This utterance, too, of course, is in the form of a prayer. It's a prayer that Jewish mothers would have taught their children to pray from the time of infancy in Jesus' day. The same way that your mother probably taught you, or you taught your children to pray, now I lay me down to sleep. Jewish mothers in Jesus' day would have taught their children to pray, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus is asking God in prayer, why have you forsaken me? But with his very next breath, he prays, into your hands I commit my spirit. Father, I am in pain, but into your hands I commit my spirit. I don't know what will happen next, but into your hands I commit my spirit. I want to point out to you that this too, of course, is in the form of scripture, which is to say that Jesus had studied the scriptures. His whole life was shaped by them. In the beginning of his ministry, when he was being tempted by the evil one, he quoted scripture in his own defense. And now his whole life has been shaped by scripture. 
he saw himself first as the kind of good shepherd that was prophesied by the prophet Ezekiel. And now he's fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah 53 as he becomes a suffering servant. He's on the cross and he's praying scripture, which reminds me of the importance for us, likewise, to study the scriptures and to allow our lives, the whole of our lives, the length and breadth and height and depth of our lives to be shaped by scripture. So I hope that you will continue even beyond this season to read the Bible and to let the Bible shape your life. Let these scriptures become your prayers. Which brings me to the next of the steps, and that, of course, is the step of serving. This is a rhythm of life. Uh, we wake and we uh, pray, here I am, Lord, send me. We go on a mission. We go about our work. We go on ministry. We pay attention all day, every day. We listen for the call of God in our lives, and we listen for the cry of people in need around us. And we give ourselves, not only to God, but to others in God's name. A few days before Palm Sunday, Jesus had said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And now he's on the cross, he's offering himself not only in service to God, but to others in God's name. He believes that his death is serving uh, to sacrifice the sins of the whole world. He's on the cross and he has this tender moment. Mary is standing at the foot of the cross there by uh, one of his younger disciples, the disciple John, who in his gospel called himself the beloved disciple. And Jesus, while he is serving all of humankind, while he's serving God, also takes a moment to be mindful of others that he needs to serve. He turns to his own mother and he says, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. With this act of service, Jesus is serving his own family. He's taking care of his own mother. But he's also modeling for us what we should be doing, which is to say that if we are a part of his family, if we are adopted by the blood of his cross, that means that we have responsibility to love and to care for one another. John wasn't Mary's natural child, not a biological child. But Jesus was giving her to him and him to her. And Jesus has given us to one another that we might, in acts of service, love and care for one another as if we are family, because indeed we are a part of God's family. Which brings me to the next act, which is the one of sharing and bearing witness to our faith. Jesus said, let your light so shine before all the world that they will see your good works and give glory to your God who is in heaven. And his death on the cross was showing us who God is. He was showing us the height and the depth, the length and the breadth of God's love for us. He stretched out his arms and said, I love you this much. And with that, he died. Your sins are nailed to the cross and there's forgiveness for you. He's done away all that is necessary for your redemption, for your salvation. The very night before he was betrayed, he told his closest friends that his mission was that he had come to seek and save the lost. Search the scriptures. What you'll find is that the church authorities always found fault with him because he was hanging out with all the wrong people, with sinners and tax collectors and prostitutes. He was seeking and saving the lost. He told them story after story, uh, like the one where he described a shepherd who had a flock of a hundred sheep, and one was missing, so he secured the ninety-nine, and he went in search of the one. He told another story about a father whose son had foolishly squandered his inheritance, but the father offered him mercy and indeed celebrated with a party, for he, he told the boy's brother, your son, your brother was dead, but now he is alive. He was lost, and now he is found. Jesus wants to say to 
us to you and to me. If you've wandered away, God is looking for you. If you've squandered your life, God will give you new life. God is rich in mercy and abounding in steadfast love. He's willing to forgive even more than you are willing to ask for forgiveness, which brings us, of course, to the next utterance, which is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In his book, The Walk, Adam Hamilton reminds us that Jesus' words here are not meant just then for them, but once and for all, for all people, which is to say that the word of pardon was not for a particular time or place, but for all people in all times. That when Jesus was on the cross, you were on his mind, which is to say that the word of pardon that he was speaking is a word of pardon that is extended even to this day to you. And I wonder if you might be like one of the old people who overheard the word of pardon that Jesus spoke. They were the ones who were the closest by. As the crowds were jeering, there were two thieves that were being crucified with Jesus. One of them joined with the crowds and was teasing and mocking Jesus, but the other uh, tried to hush him up and said, don't you understand? You and I deserve what we're giving, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then he turns to Jesus and he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. To say that God remembers is to say that God delivers. When God remembers someone, God offers deliverance to them. And Jesus offers that kind of deliverance as he speaks to the thief on the cross and says, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Yes, Jesus came to seek and to save us and to bring us into his fold, to invite us to walk into his embrace. And he's sharing his faith as surely on the cross with deeds as much as he does so with these words which brings us to the fifth expression of our discipleship, which is generosity or self-giving. We're called to give ourselves away time and time again, not just with our time and our talent, but also with our treasure. We are to engage in acts of agape, which are, is selfless, self-giving, sacrificial love. And Jesus reminds us that those to whom much is given, of them much will be uh, expected. It's a daily rhythm of giving and receiving agape love from God and sharing it with others in God's name. And on the cross, God is expressing self-giving. The gospel in a single verse is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that self-giving is seen in the last statements that we come to. The first of those is the simple expression, I thirst. If perhaps you have ever sat with someone at the point of death, you know that often uh, our lips become parched, our mouths become chapped, and indeed it's quite common for people to take a little cotton swab and put a bit of moisture on people's lips or to take a straw and get a few drops of water and drop it on the tongue, or to put some ice chips in the mouth of someone who is parched. But there seems to be something more going on here. Jesus, in fact, has already refused a cup of wine that was mingled with gall. When he speaks these words, I thirst, we need to remember that this is in John's gospel. And when John is writing, he's always writing on two levels, not only the literal level, but there's a deeper symbolic level. And indeed, I think that we're supposed to remember something that happened earlier in John's gospel. John in chapter four tells a story of Jesus going and meeting a Samaritan woman at the well, a woman who had been married and divorced five times and uh, was living down a bad reputation among the women in her village. And Jesus comes to her and says, give me something to drink. And she says, who are you, a Jewish man, to ask me, a Samaritan woman, for something to drink? Because men didn't talk to women and Jews didn't talk to Samaritans. And Jesus said to her, 
if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask of me and I would give you living water, water that would quench your thirst so that you would never thirst ever again. He was promising her a life of joy and meaning of hope and love and forgiveness. Jesus is the source of this living water. And now at the end of his gospel, Jesus is saying, I thirst, which is to say that the, everything that he has has been poured out. He has given himself all that he has and all that he is, he has given for your salvation and for mine. He's completely spent. And so he's modeling that giving even in his death on the cross. And with that, he utters the final word, te telestai, which in our translation is, it is finished. And although we may be tempted to read those words with an attitude of defeat, it is really a cry of celebration. Jesus has accomplished that which he has come to do. Now he can die. All that God has given him to do has been accomplished. He came to lay down his life for the sake of the entire world and to restore us to a right relationship with God and to remind us that there is no power on earth, no power or principality, no height nor depth, nothing in all of earth, not even the power of death will be able to separate us from God's love for us. And so as we journey on, as we join this parade that will take us through Holy Week to Monday, Thursday and Good Friday, to Silent Saturday and to Easter, as we contemplate the words that Jesus spoke from his cross, my prayer is that we will remember the marks of discipleship, the prayer and worship, the study of scripture, the self-giving, the servant spirit, the sharing of our faith, that we can remember all of those and that we may be shaped by them in our life, in our death and in our resurrection. May God bless us as we journey on, as the parade continues in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.